hey girl, I see you and I know it is not easy. You are juggling a million things, but guess what? You're killing it. And so find the passions that you love in life and chase after them. Don't give time or energy to things that don't matter. Don't give financial resources to things that don't align with your values and truly go after what makes you happy because at the end of the day, you're stuck with you and you want to make sure that you're comfortable with the person that you are. Welcome to the Heal, Rise, Shine podcast, a show about womanhood, empowering women, and celebrating each other. Each show, I will bring you a daily live warrior woman who stepped into her passion and light, women like you and me, because we all have an amazing story to tell. Let's heal, rise, and shine together. Hello, 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 lovely humans. Welcome back to the Heal, Rise, Shine podcast. I am anna Sophie Drost and I will be your host. It's still May and it's still Mental Health Awareness Month. Here on this channel, we are not directly talking about Mental Health Awareness Month, but topics that help us with that. So last week we had Adi and she brought a whole new perspective into our life with meditation, with yoga and taking care of yourself, which also is very important for your mental health. We talked about taking the time out. And today, as you saw from the title of this podcast, we are going to talk about. And according to the American Psychological Association, money is the top cause of stress in the United States and probably around the world. I could not think of a single country in this world that does not have money issues. So imagine money is our number one stress factor. And it's the one thing that either makes or breaks us. And that has a lot to do with the lack of education about money. You don't learn it at school. You don't learn how to handle it. And if your parents don't tell you about it, you're basically screwed. Thank God nowadays there are a lot of programs and a lot of people out there, but it's still it's so much information and where to start and it just feels so overwhelming because it's so important and so many numbers and at that point probably all of you have shut out. <laughs> I have to be honest, I also have a difficult relationship with money. It's not that I ever lacked it. I never had a lack of money. I grew up in the upper middle class family. I always went on vacation. I always got what I needed. That was not the issue, never ever. My parents educated me about money. My dad specifically educated me and that probably is the problem because I have a scare of not having money. He grew up very poorly and I feel guilty spending money. That's my issue with money. So I just save everything I can. With this mentality, it helps a lot, of course. When I finished my master studies, I put myself on a very tight budget and managed to pay off my student loan of 10,000 euros in a year. So that was amazing. And now I also have to save up a lot of money. But still, I feel guilty every time I spend money. And that also should not be. That is also not having a good relationship with money. Especially when it comes to investing in myself and investing in my business, I have to stop feeling guilty about this because it's just important. Investing is important, making smart investments. I'm not talking about buying a hundred thousand courses you're never going to complete or just justify everything you buy. Oh, I'm buying this for my business. No, it's not working like that, but you know what I'm talking about. But also things I need, for example, I need a new pair of sneakers I just realized yesterday oh I think my current sneakers are falling apart just mind that I only have one pair of sneakers it's giving me a headache knowing that I need to spend money on this and shoes are expensive because I'm investing in good quality I make sure it's sustainably sourced and everybody is paid 
fairly on the process of making it and no kids are involved in this one. So I invest in that and it's giving me a headache because I know it's going to cost me money and uh, yeah. And the other issue is, as you know, when you're reading my microblogging on Instagram that I'm also in the process of starting to invest in stocks and stuff. And I'm really scared to make the wrong choice. And I'm over-informing myself. And informing yourself is amazing. But over-informing yourself is just another form of procrastination, basically. And as you just see, theoretically, I know all of this. But emotionally, I'm not there yet. <sighs> it's a lot. So as you see, money also gives me a headache. I still have a lot to figure out there mostly on an emotional basis. I think I can handle it quite well. But just these last things, you know, like the investment. The investment I have not figured out yet and that's my step that I'm going to take. I'm going to talk about money today with Kelly from Money Girl Coaching. We met as we were investing in ourselves. <laughs> Funny enough, on a group coaching call with Boss Babe and I loved her, loved her vibe and I prefer talking about money with women to be honest. So she had quite a journey behind her as well and she's going to talk about this in the podcast. She had a huge amount of student loans. I think she had around $50,000 of student loans and she just at some point she just wanted to pay it off. She had enough. She didn't want to be in debt anymore and just start to invest in herself as well. And pretty much a year ago, she became debt free basically by paying off most of her debts within two years versus before she paid off a very little amount of money within eight years. That just shows you what you can do when you become intentional. And now she is coaching other women to do the same and to learn to live on a budget. And she's not someone who's super strict like I am, but she's more like, okay, we're budgeting. This is your budget for going out. This is your budget for clothing and blah, blah, blah. In the end, it's important how much you want to save up. And with the rest of it, you have to deal with it. And she guides you through this process and helps you, okay, maybe at this point you're overspending. Maybe She's a coach. She's a coach around money. She has amazing energy. She has her own story. She knows what she's doing there. And I really, really love this conversation with her. And I hope you're going to enjoy it yourself. And as always, you can find me on the Heal, Rise, Shine Instagram channel. You can DM me and you can share this episode and you can find Kelly at Money Girl Coaching. And as always, I will link everything in the show notes. And we are also going to talk about other accounts she finds super helpful during this episode. So all those accounts are linked in the show notes as well. And she even has a 90 day tracker for you. And the link for that is also in the show notes. So there's so much information that you just go. This episode is going to bring you so much value. And I really, really encourage you to master your money and to break free of the cycle and get your head clean and not needing to stress about it anymore. So with that, let's dive into the episode. Hi Kelly, thank you so much for making the time for coming on this podcast today. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. That's wonderful. How are you doing today? I'm really great. I have a barky dog, so please ignore her in <laughs> the background, but she should be settling down. Otherwise, yeah, it's a beautiful sunny day here in Minnesota, and so glad to be with you. That's wonderful. Here on the podcast, we always love to dive right in. Are you ready? Yes, I am ready. Awesome. Kelly, what does it mean to you to be a woman? So this is a really great question because I think it can be so different for everyone. But I think in this time in 2021, as we're recording, a woman to me is someone that is strong. It is someone that knows 
their value. It is someone that is unapologetic about chasing their dreams. And it is someone that knows their worth. I love that very much. And would you call yourself a feminist? And why or why not? Absolutely. A feminist is just someone that supports other women. And I am all about not only women, but everyone. I think we really in this day and age could use a little bit of love for one another. And so yes, I'm a fem feminist. Absolutely. Um, women are amazing, and they should continue to kill it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that very much. Thank you so much. Now I would love to dive a little bit into you. Tell me about you. Tell me about your background story, where you come from, how did you grow up, and so on. Yeah, so that's a great question. So I grew up in an average middle-income household. My dad was actually in the military, and so we traveled around quite a bit. But once I settled into high school, we kind of found a home in Wisconsin here in the United States. And I was a normal high school person. I enjoyed going out with friends and I quickly found myself into college once I turned 18. And I, from at that point, started my normal college life. I studied abroad um, a couple of different times. I lived a few hours away. And so I had a great college experience, but with that brought some debt. And that kind of is where my story started from. After I graduated from college, I was in the Peace Corps in West Africa for a couple of years. And so I prolonged paying off debt for a little bit longer because it just wasn't a priority in my life at that time. And I think at that age, I was young in my 20s, Personal finance wasn't anything that I really knew much about. I wasn't an expert. I wasn't taught about this growing up. And it definitely was instilled in me to pay my bills, but it wasn't ever instilled in, instilled in me to get ahead and to kind of take full control of my finances. And so I was kind of always living that day to day, paycheck to paycheck, and I was okay, but I was never thriving. And so after eight years of paying my student loans, I kind of had a moment of, I am completely done and overwhelmed. I felt like I was working all these extra jobs and trying to make all this progress to make my future better, but I was actually making no progress at all. And so I ended up looking up the amount of student loans that I had at that point. And I had been paying off my student loans for eight years at this point, mind you. And I had only paid off about $13,000, which is nothing in eight years. And so that just shows you what not being intentional and not putting your money towards a goal will do to you. You make no progress. And so at that point, at that very moment, I made a commitment to myself to do better, to learn and to build a future that I could honestly be proud of. That is how I started on the mission to become debt free. I googled all the different people, all the different plans to try to figure out how do you pay off this extra debt because I honestly didn't even know that it was a possibility in my in my future in my plan. I didn't even think of it as an option like I said. I found a few people that I didn't 100% vibe with their plan. They had good plans, but they were either restrictive or they were too loosey goosey. And I definitely, this was something that I wanted to accomplish. And so I started creating my own plan and I started tracking my progress and putting it out on social media to hold myself accountable. And after 20 months, I was able to pay off $46,514.91, not to be specific. <laughs> um, but that was because. At that exact moment, like I said, I looked up how much debt I had and that was the exact number. And I was like, oh, hell no, I am done. And so in 20 months of being intentional, not making any more money than I had the year before, I just put every extra penny that I had towards my debt and I was able to pay it off early. And so at that point, I had people asking me, what are you doing? How are you doing this? What are you selling? And I wasn't selling anything. I was just getting out of debt and telling the whole world about it, right? And that's how Money Gal was born. And that's how my passion for personal finance, for budgeting kind of came to be, was it impacted and it changed my life so much that I was on a mission to tell everybody else about it. That is really an incredible story and I love it. I have a couple of questions. First of all, you studied abroad, you studied in France and you also spent some time in Senegal, which led you to more debts or not being able to pay off. But would you still, looking back, do it again or 
a broad experience for me personally something that is not that is irreplaceable how do you feel about it now Oh, that was non-negotiable for me. And I feel the same way today. I was going to do everything in my power to study abroad. I was the freshman that showed up to the study abroad office and was like, hey, what do I need to do? And they're like, okay, normally juniors, third year study abroad. So you have a little bit of time. So like come back later. And granted, I could have started saving for studying abroad at that point if I would have known, but I didn't. I wouldn't have given that up. I would have paid that debt over and over again. There's so much that you learn while studying abroad or living abroad or working abroad, being outside of your normal habitat and community is, it's irreplaceable. I would say France put me in way more debt than Senegal did. Um, not only is it just an expensive country compared to Senegal, it's very much more expensive, right? But I studied abroad there twice and I was a full-time student and I was at the age where I was, and I was in a position where I was studying but then playing really hard because you're in Paris and you're 18 or I was I actually turned 21 in France um, which doesn't matter in any other country besides the United States but no. um <laughs> no I was like I'm 21 and they're like nobody cares and um <laughs> but and so I was at a place of going out and buying things and shopping and travel I traveled all over Europe when I was also in France that put me more into debt I actually ended up taking out a personal loan to pay off my credit cards which I then had to pay off at a later date. But again, I wouldn't have regretted it for the world. And then Senegal, I was very much Peace Corps working, living with a family. And so I wasn't partying. I wasn't going out. I took one trip while I was there actually to Thailand, also a very affordable country. Senegal didn't put me more into debt other than postponing paying off my debt since I wasn't working a traditional job. I wasn't paying any extra towards my student loans. I actually had them paused and I was still paying interest on them. And I also wasn't investing into any retirement or 401k. So I wasn't building wealth while I was in Senegal, but still absolutely worth it. I love that. I totally agree. How is that in the States? You said you pay interest on your student loans? Fun. Yeah. Oh, how much? A lot. It depends on there's multiple different types of loans. If you have a, a loan, a government loan, you can either have interest that accrues. Otherwise, you can have interest that doesn't accrue while you're doing certain things. Some situations might be if you're still in school, interest might not be accruing. Or if you're doing like Peace Corps actually counts for your interest isn't accruing. But only for certain types of loans. And everyone has all the other types of loans also. The other loan, student loans that I had, while there was still a student loan, it wasn't a personal loan, I was paying interest anywhere from, they were relatively low at that time, but two to 7% every single month while I was abroad. And so I remember my dad was actually helping me make some interest payments Granted, the interest payments weren't huge. They were like $50, $75. Like, I don't know off the top of my head. Being able to keep up with that, I'm forever grateful because it wasn't accruing interest on interest, right? That's where we get in trouble is when you're, your interest for one month is great, but then the next month that becomes part of your principal balance. And so now you're paying interest on that amount. It's very normal for people to end up 10 years down the line, you haven't paid off your student loans yet, to actually be paying more than you originally took out because of all the interest and it just doesn't work in your favor. Wow, that's horrible. That's horrifying, actually. I come from a very privileged position here in Germany because we don't pay any school fees. I actually, I was on a private school, so I paid fees, but I had that money from my grandfather when he died, he left me money. So I could pay my whole three years for that. So it was nothing compared to that. And I once took a loan for when I did my master's and the interest was 0.01%. <laughs> That makes me want to go in a corner and cry. <laughs> so that's why I'm like, oh, wow. Like two to 7%. That's on a student loan. That's insane. And that's a student loan. Imagine the people that either don't qualify for student loans or, you yeah. know, you can only take out so many. So now students are using personal loans, which have higher interest rates. They're putting it on their credit cards, which is even worse, all because we have this mentality around society where education is so important and you have to go. And while it is very important, I would also never give back my student loan debt for not having a degree. I'm, I'm also in a master's program right now, so I really value education. It just, it's a little bit of 
a scam, if you ask me, how much money institutions are willing to charge students and then how much money they make off of students. It's a little insane here in the United States. Hopefully something that we fix someday, but we're definitely very far behind a lot of other countries in the world. <laughs> Besides the financial struggles you had throughout your life, obviously, I know you were working the whole time. You started like waitressing when you were 14. So it's not like you weren't out of job for 20 years. You were working the whole time and still you needed this amount of money to be able to study. Yeah, I had um, my parents owned a restaurant also while I was growing up. And so I was a waitress from day one. I feel like I was like free labor until they were legally allowed to hire me until I was allowed to work. And then I was paid labor, right? Waitressing in high school, waitressing in college, waitressing after college once I even still had a full-time job. I really loved waitressing. It was a way for me to supplement my income and to always just kind of have that cash coming in. But what I wasn't doing and what so many people aren't doing is being intentional with that extra money. It doesn't make any sense to make extra money, to put all that effort into another job, away from your family, away from your friends, away from hobbies, when you aren't directly putting that money towards your debt. And that's what I was doing wrong for so long. I was making decent money. I could have paid off my debt a lot sooner, but instead I thought working more was the right thing. When in fact, paying more money towards your debt turns out plot twist is the right thing. And it seems so simple, but when you're in that frame of mind, when you're not taught about personal finance, when you're not taught about, hey, if you just paid an extra $50 a month, look at how much sooner that you can pay off your student loans. When you're not taught any of that, you don't implement any of those things. And so um, it became very much like me just spending that money that I was, that extra money that I was making on other things. What were your biggest spending parts in oh, your life? Oh, it was restaurants and alcohol. And and mind you, I was 20, so I was 18 to 23 when I was in college, like a normal age. And you like to go out with friends and you'd like to have a certain lifestyle. I lived in a crappy apartment, but I still like wanted to go out to eat and wanted to hang out with my friends and do fun things and be social. And then After that, I moved to the big city. I moved to Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is very large in comparison. And so I was going downtown. I was, I had a day job where I had enough. I had more money than I have ever had right at that point in my life. I, I wouldn't say that it's a lot of money looking back now, but I had never made that amount of money before. And so I think these first jobs, we still had this inflated lifestyle because we've never had a paycheck coming in on a regular basis. Then when I got back from the Peace Corps, I was making a little bit more money, but not that much more and still had that inflated lifestyle. And so I think the problem was I was going out to eat and I was buying alcohol and going to bars way too often. And Uh, it probably makes me sound a little bit like an alcoholic or something, but I was just a normal, a normal 20 something year old. And when I started writing down how much money I was spending on restaurants, I was just like curious and started tracking how much I was making in tips and not knowing where any of that money was going. That's where I started to be like, wait a minute, I made a thousand dollars in tips in the last three weeks. I don't have a penny to show it. Right. I paid my bills. I maybe did a, a couple other things that were like responsible, but otherwise I paid no extra money towards my debt. I didn't have any money in my savings account. And so that's when I started to ask myself, what am I doing with this money and where is it all going? It all comes back to mindset. And I think especially women, we struggle a lot with the issue of money or even the topic of money. I don't know how it is in the US, but here talking about money is not something you really do. <laughs> It is the exact same here. With that comes also that a lot of times in your family or in your relationship or whatever, it's the male counterpart that takes care of the money, of the expenses and of the overview and the whatever. It's a lot, oftentimes you're like, yeah, yeah, you do it. And you just give away all the power that you have to someone else. Just because it's a bunch of numbers and a lot of us were never good at math. And so we are like, ah, this is math. I don't want to do that. I just ship it off. It's the exact same here. I would say that I think younger generations, mine included, are 
trying to get away from the the man has the finances, right? I think it's very similar across the world in that aspect, but it's still a thing. And money is very taboo to talk about here in the United States. You would never ask somebody how much money they make or how much they pay for their mortgage. Or of course, we have these conversations with maybe close friends or as we're I ask these people questions all the time. I have my first meeting with them and I'm like, how much money do you make? And they're like, oh, we're like getting into it, aren't we? And I'm like, I want to know everything. And so it gets a little scary. But once we drop down those guards and we start talking about it and we, I love it when clients at, like still say, I spend $300 a month on groceries. And they'll say, is that normal? Because we don't know what normal is. We don't know what our friends spend on things. And then I have the ability to say, I am a household of two. This is what I spend. I work with other clients that have a few kids. This is what they spend. And so then you can start gauging like, okay, my spending is normal or plot twist. Oh my gosh, my spending is out of control. There is no reason why I need to be spending this much money on this item when so many people do it for so much cheaper. And so that taboo, that mindset of this is my, like, this is, it's almost like a shameful thing or society says we can't talk about it or how dare you even bring that up? All of those things limit us and they prohibit us from making advances and from making our lives better. When in reality, if we were to open up these conversations, if we were to talk with our friends about simple personal finance money topics, we'd be able to drastically improve our lives. And why do you think is that, that we are so hesitant to talk about money? I think it's because money is a source of either really great things or really bad things in our lives. People view it as if you're, you know, if you're quote unquote poor, if you don't make a lot of money, it's kind of, you don't want to bring it up because how dare you talk about how much money you make when these other people are unfortunate and they don't have as much money as you. Or why would you ask this millionaire how much money he makes and how much he spends on groceries? Like you look like this person that is digging into their business. And while we don't have to like ask every person we meet how much money they make or what they spend on groceries, I think there's a lot of value in you and your partner at least talking about money. How much money do we spend on things? How much money do we want to be spending on things more importantly? What are our goals? How much money do we need to achieve those goals? So within a within a household, we should absolutely open up money conversations. Kids at the, in the house don't necessarily need to know how much money mom and dad make because they will tell everyone on the playground, but they can know mom and dad, these are our goals. We want to pay for X, Y, and Z. We want to set aside money for this. We want to ensure that we have a trip every year. And in order to go on that trip, we have to spend less money in these other areas. So you can still talk about money with kids without going into very specific money examples. And then even broadening it outside of our house, you should be able to talk to your best girlfriends about how much money you spend on groceries or hair care or simple, simple things that we spend money on all the time to be able to gauge is what I'm spending normal? Should I, do I need to increase my income? And then just other simple personal finance things. We should be able to open up conversations within our friends. Yeah, I think so too. And I think not just the spending part, but also the investing part, because there's a lot of insurances out there wanting our money and (laughs) ripping us off with a lot of interest and Mm -hmm. whatever. And then there is this huge field of investing yourself in, I don't know the exact English word. Is it also called ETF? Like electronic trade fund. It's it's a type of investment. Yeah. Yeah. Like stuff like that. I started talking with my girls about these things, but I also know like one of my best friends, she's making money for the first time in her life. And she was like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't? No. She, she is absolutely... Because here in Germany, the thing is, we have this illusion of getting payment when when we retire from the state. But in our generation, especially women, we run into poverty there. It will not be enough to be able to live off, especially when you live abroad, like I did a lot and like my best friend is also doing right now. And it's like, okay, you have to start investing 
and you have to find other ways so that you can secure your retirement. Absolutely. We have this similar thing in, in the States here. It's called Social Security, and there will just not be enough for our generation. And I think my parents' generation, they kind of take it as like, I deserve this. I've put into this fund my entire life. But I think there's a new thought. There's a new, I mean, ownership in the younger generations around I don't want to rely on the government to give me a tiny check every single month to live when I'm older. I want to take full advantage of investing into taking care of myself for the future on my own. I trust myself. I know that this money will be there because I'm doing it and you can't always rely on somebody else. Similar to what you're talking about earlier with relying on a spouse or a partner to do the finances, you can't trust that they're just doing everything correctly Two brains are better than one for sure. But the same with investing. That's when you set money aside today, you're investing in your future self. And it seems simple when you say it out loud, but putting it into practice can be a lot harder. It's harder to say no right now. We want that instant gratification to delay our right now happiness for a future that is truly fulfilled. It is so important that once we get our finances in order, once we're no longer underwater, once we can manage the stress a little bit, that we actually set money aside into these stocks, into 401ks, into whatever opportunities that you have. And that truly needs to be step one. That comes before vacations, that comes before saving for Christmas and extravagant weddings and buying houses. We truly need to invest in ourselves because of this beautiful thing called compound interest. And it is only on your side if you have enough time for it to work its magic. And so the sooner that you can start investing, the sooner that money can gain interest, unlike the opposite we were talking about earlier, where you're paying interest, good for those companies for getting their interest, right? But this can work for you. To sum all of that up, investing in ourselves, making that a priority, setting that money aside. In the States, they recommend 10 to 15%. People love to do more than more than 15, 20%. There's also like the FIRE community, financial independence, retire early. And their whole shtick is they put in like 40% plus every, and it's insane the amount of money that they invest, but they retire in like 20 years, 15 years. And these are 45, 50 year olds that are done working or they're done having mandatory work. They can now go after passions they truly love. So that's a super long ramp, but it's basically a way to say, yes, you need to invest in yourself. You can't just budget. You also need to do other things to set yourself, your future financial self up for success. Yeah. I just want to sum it up a little bit. What we just talked about to become the mastermind of yourself and of your future and of your money. So first of all, you need to understand your current situation. How much debt are you in? What are you spending your money on? Like track your money, track where you spend it, make an Excel sheet, write it down per hand. It really doesn't matter. Find a system that works for you. And then you understand what your situation is. And second of all, pay off your debt. First and most important thing ever, pay off your debt because the interest is going to kill you at some point. So second, do that. And then third point, also have a backup. That's what I also say is really important, like have a backup of like three months at least so that in case anything happens, it doesn't matter. It's not the end of the world. I have a backup of three months. I have three months to get a new job, to get whatever. And then you have to start investing in yourself, in your future and stuff like that. Because you did a lot of research. I do most of my research in German because it's such a difficult topic. So I don't have the best, (laughs) for my international audience, I don't have the best resources because they're all in German. What would you suggest, besides yourself, of course, (laughs) but what would you suggest are people who have brought out books, platforms, whatever, uh, where you think these are really good? So there are a million different things that you can go, which is kind of the direction where I got just overwhelmed because everyone is saying something different. But I think if you want to start off, um, there's a couple of good websites that I like. There's the Nerd Wallet. Of course, some of their stuff is paid ads, so you always have to be careful about that. I also try to follow. There's Deeper Than Money. There is Blonde Broken Bougie is fun. Um, The financial gym has some interesting stuff. Dave Ramsey, of course, is a big name there. I I think the thing is besides 
noting on these specific people or companies, you need to find someone that resonates with you because some people like Dave Ramsey will say, don't you dare step into a restaurant until all of your debt is paid, right? And then there's people like myself and many others, the new, the younger generations that say, you can go inside of a restaurant, just make sure it's in your budget. It kind of depends on who you resonate with and what your goals are. Because if your goals are to truly pay off all of your debt and you wanna be very intentional and very intense about it, you might wanna follow a Dave Ramsey plan. But if you want to enjoy life a little bit, if you want to go on vacation, if you want to have some fun, then maybe you follow a plan um, like myself or others have followed as well. And I think once you start researching some of these sites, Google how to get on a budget, you'll see that you, there's either like one or two of the extremes. It's kind of black or white. And depending on what path you want to go, you can follow um, one of those people. Thank you very much. I think that is also very important to have like different, because like you said, especially what I think also is really complicated for women with money, that most of the information out there is tailored for men. It's a, and a lot of men are giving out the information. So it's a, definitely another tone than women have while talking. I also try to get my information mostly from women because I just resonate differently. And the message just spreads differently than when a man is like, no, you don't, you, 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 you know, this. <laughs> well, and our goals are different. And honestly, yeah. look this up. There's the pink tax and our stuff just costs more money. And if your listeners don't know what that means, it's our razor blades cost more than a man's razor blades. Our shaving oh, yeah. cream costs more than a, than a um, male shaving cream. Our simple daily living things are more expensive than a man's for some unknown reason that I'm sure we could pinpoint a hundred reasons. But the point is, is that why would you follow a male's advice when he doesn't even know what you're dealing with? He doesn't know the things you have to save money for. He doesn't resonate with your goals necessarily. And so I truly, when I first started, I took principles from Dave Ramsey. I really loved how intentional and extreme he was because I was also so angry at my debt that I was like on par with what he was talking about. But then when it comes to like building my budget, following long-term people, they are all women. They are all around my age, if not a little bit younger or a little bit older, but I follow the girlfriends that I would love to have a drink with, right? It's all about finding those people that you resonate with. That's completely true. And Coming to your dad, we had a little conversation of the difference of generations and of the habit of spending money. We are like, we have completely different backgrounds. For me, I'm from a family post-war generation. This country was completely destroyed when my parents were born and they grew up in poverty, of course, in this country was not like in the fifties, it, it was just poor. And they had to work themselves out there. And they actually did. My parents now are like upper middle class. My dad started as an electrician and he retired as a public account manager. My mom was in cosmetics and she retired as a doctor. So they really worked themselves up, but they still knew what does it mean when I have to budget, when I have basically nothing. Contrary to me, I grew up, I didn't know that we have a lot of money. It was not like me running around being a trust fund kid that was just spending. <laughs> For me, it was normal that we went on holidays and we were traveling and there was always, there was always food on the table. I had a big, nice room. I had actually two because my parents are separated. <laughs> so I had two rooms and two households. These things were normal to me, but still my parents, they taught me how valuable money is and that you have to budget it. And my dad, when we went on holidays, he went with me to the supermarket and he was like, okay, now we're going to buy this because this is 10 cents cheaper than this one. And you have to look at the total gram or KG price and compare it and not what is written on the big tag, but what is written in small there. And I still go shopping like this. I still budget when I do my grocery shopping. I'm like, ah, this is cheaper than this, so I get the cheaper one. Um, but you grew up completely different. Yeah, I think there's definitely some similarities, but I didn't have any of that financial education. As I got older, I think as I was in my 20s and I would call my mom and she'd clearly be like, you don't know what you're doing in a grocery store. Why are you buying this? I think she would give me some of those helpful pointers. But yeah, growing up, same thing. We had food on the table, but my parents, they grew up from 
their parents, so my grandparents were of the Great Depression era, and so they had nothing. And so I think my parents saw, and then I'm speaking for our, our generation, right? Our parents saw how their parents grew up, and our parents were like, we have more money than they did, and we are going to enjoy it because I grew up poor, and that is not how I'm going to live anymore, and that's how I'm not going to raise my kids. And so I lived um, near the ocean, and we had jet skis, and we had a boat, and we had all these things. But looking back, we had debt for those things. We didn't just buy a boat, right? We had a monthly payment. and But to my, my parents, it was worth the monthly payment to have the fun and to have the family experiences of a boat. And so I grew up having all the things, but then with all the debt coming along with it, and we just didn't talk about money. And so I didn't know about it, but I was never hungry. I had never not had school clothing, right? Like things were always supplied to me, but at an expense. And so now I'm kind of seeing a little bit of that. And I think Um, I think a lot of people my age, it's not uncommon if they're the first ones to go to college. And so it was very much instilled on me that you will go to school. We don't know. You need to figure out how you're going to pay for it. You're probably just going to get student loans. It's just a fact of life, but you're going to go to school. And so I remember showing up that first day and realizing I needed a laptop. And um, this was 2005. So it wasn't like we all had laptops back then. And so I literally had to like go to the little the bookstore on campus, take it alone, get a computer, and that's just normal. And while I appreciate everything that my parents did for me and all the sacrifices that they made financially as well, paying the interest on these items, I am choosing to not live my life that way. We don't need a jet ski or a boat if we can't pay for it. We don't need a new laptop if we can't pay for it. And sometimes, especially nowadays, you have the 0% for a year. And so there are some ways to get these nicer items and not have to pay for it in full and cash right away. But I'm very much less of a spender because I saw my parents being spenders and then it putting them into debt and not, I don't want to say debt in like a, we were hundreds of thousands of dollars and they had to file bankruptcy. Like none of that happened, which I think is almost worse. There was no severe downside to their debt besides the monthly payment. And if the monthly payment doesn't bother you then the debt doesn't bother you. But I just got to a point where I was like, I don't need all the things. The things aren't important to me. And so I'm going to live a life that I can afford. And that way, if anything happens, if shit hits the fan, if COVID is a thing, I don't have all these monthly payments that I have to worry about. Yeah. Yeah. And you you have a really good point there. It's what is worth spending to you. And that is actually a psychological thing because we spend a lot of money on a lot of things we don't need. We think we want them in the moment and then like um, two months later, they're like in the corner somewhere. That happens with a lot of stuff, like people upgrading their wardrobe every season, which to me is quite insane, but everybody their own pleasure. But what actually happens with this stuff, you know, once you buy it, it becomes worthless. But if it's worth to you, if it's worth spending to you then do that if if that really truly brings you joy then then go do that but that's also a psychological part in your brain that you have to enter when you have spending issues first of all see what you're spending on and then second of all what are your habits are you an emotional buyer are you intentional or do you think about the stuff you buy or is it all about fun can you not have not fun you know (laughs) Yeah. So what do you think about that? It's absolutely. And everyone is so different with what they value and what they want to spend money on. And to my parents, it was the new toy. Like they loved that because it was an experience for their family. And to me, it's not about the things, it's about the experiences. So I'm still very similar to that, but without the physical things. And I think your example of clothing is a perfect example. How many of us can look into our closets and we have something with a tag on it still? We haven't even worn it or something we've worn like once or twice yet. In the moment, we had to have that shirt, right? And either we're not even thinking about buying it or we're not seeing the impact that that purchase is having in our lives. Because once you start budgeting and if you go over budget and clothing and you have to say, okay, now I have to pull this money from vacation or now I have to start pulling this money from like my grad school fund, that starts to hurt a little bit more. When you start having to pull money from categories that are your true life goals and ambitions to fund a new shirt, you start asking yourself, 
was the shirt worth it? And some people it's yes. And some people it's no, which is why personal finance, I say this over and over again, is personal because everybody is different. And what you put in your budget should be a direct reflection on what you value most. And to me, just like you, it's not clothing. I think I saved like $10 a month on clothing, like just in case I happen to randomly buy something or I save it up for four or five months and then I'll buy a couple of things. But I am sure to include restaurants, alcohol, vacation in my budget. Cause those are very important things to me. I like experiences with friends and I like going places. And so I think when we start to track our spending and we figure out why we're potentially spending in areas of what you were saying earlier, do we shop out of boredom? Is it a social thing that we do with our friends? We meet up at the mall or we go to target. Is it something that late at night when we're going to bed, we're just perusing Amazon and we're just adding stuff to our carts without even thinking of it. Figure out what causes you to potentially overspend. And then let's try to reverse some of those habits if it's not in line with your budget. And by tracking your spending is the first way. I have a free tool. I'll give you a link to it if you want to put it in the show notes, but it's a 90 day expense tracker. And basically you put your expenses for the last 90 days. It's in three different buckets. It averages it all up for you. And it tells you how much you averagely spend in each category. And then you can ask yourself, is this number scary for restaurants, for clothing, whatever it is, or is this an okay number? And then on all those scary categories, that's where you can say, why am I spending the money in these categories? What is happening in my brain that caused me to do this? And that's why a lot of this this frugal movement is directly tied to minimalism. It's because do I value this item enough to spend money on it, enough for it to come out of my budget? And when we stop attaching emotions to things, we can better align our finances with what actually makes us happy. Yeah. Or not detach emotions, but think about it more. So for me, I do spend quite a high amount on clothing. My process of buying a new pair of jeans, that was somewhere last year. I bought a new pair of jeans. I made sure it's sustainably sourced. It's a fair fashion brand and it's fairly produced. I come from this industry. I know what is going on there. This is super important for me. So I put a lot of research into the items I buy. I just buy from a specific brand where I know, okay, this is clean fashion. But you pay more for that. So I pay pay over 100 euros for a pair of jeans. But I don't buy a pair of jeans every two months that was the first pair of jeans i bought in five years i think so for example i am hugely emotional with the items i shop because i so deeply want to make sure they're sustainably sourced if you create values like that around the things you buy then also you become more conscious about the things you purchase And I think that's a good point. I think detaching emotions was definitely the wrong way of putting it because it's all about being intentional, right? Intentionally buying things, backing it up with your budget and with, because your budget is a direct resource of your values. And if what you're spending money on isn't of your values, then we need to realign those values or, um, or realign our spending. I love what you put because I think it's worth investing into better quality pieces, be it clothing, be it household goods, be it whatever, less frequently than more frequently with cheaper items. And, um, but that's a direct tie to your values, right? And so um, it definitely makes sense that you're willing to invest uh, over a hundred euros for a pair of jeans, but it checks so many of your boxes that it's an easy, it's an easy decision. Yeah, I completely agree. And that really goes to everything. It's like a set of knives, for example, if you buy a good set, it lasts your lifetime. Exactly. If a woman listens to this now and says, oh my God, yeah, I I really need to get on point with my budgeting, with my spending, with my money, with everything. What are three easy changes to make right now that you would recommend? So the first thing you need to track your your spending for the last 90 days, you need to know where your money is going. You can't make any changes to a situation that you don't know what the full extent is. I would say number one, track your spending. Number two, I would outline and I would dream a little bit and decide what are my goals? What are my aspirations in life? Where do I want to be? And then I would, I would outline a budget. I would say, um, or a spending plan, whatever you want to call it. And I would say, okay, these are the things that I have to have in there. The boring, the bills, you know, groceries, everyday expenses. But then these are my goals and my aspirations and my dreams. And I want to also include those in there. And I would just start testing it out. You're not going to be great at it month one, but just start 
tracking your spending moving forward and seeing where your spending aligns with the categories that you set in your plan and see if there needs to be some work done to your habit, your spending habits. And most likely, yes, that's why we all get started on this journey is because we're spending money in places that we don't realize. But that's kind of the first few steps. Those are the first few things that I would do because, um, oh, can I add a fourth one, bonus one? I would I would add up all of the debt that you have, add up that total, and then also add up your income. So some people don't even know their income when I'm working with them, um, which is always a huge shock to me because you should know how much you're making and you should know how much debt that you have. So look at your past spending, add up your debt, your income, and then goals, dream a little bit, and then kind of just see where all of that comes together and see what areas you can start moving forward with. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Did that make sense? Yeah, for, for me, it makes, but okay. for me, it okay. makes completely sense, but I'm also in this topic. I hope for everybody else, it makes sense as well, but it's completely logic. To me, it's very logic that you first have to understand what is your situation, and then you have to dream where you want to be, and then you have to find the way, how do I get there? I think very important for everything that you do in life, and also when it comes to money of course also figuring out i loved something we also talked about before the fear of spending remember because we both put ourselves on a really strict budget where we are now in a place like "Eh, i do do i spend one euro on this (laughs) (laughs) i can unfortunately relate to that And I remember we said like, okay, they are personal investments you should do. We both joined Boss Bay, for example. That's how we met. Investing in our business in understanding how business works. It's an investment and you have to understand when it's an investment and when it's actually not. Absolutely. I think I run into a lot of questions about should I spend or should I not with my business more than my personal life. I think my personal life, I've definitely fine-tuned my budget. And I, unfortunately for myself, maybe, I've also fine-tuned my goals. I know exactly what I want in life. And so there's not a lot of wiggle room right now with my income to change a lot of that. Of course, there's some small tweaks. I just kind of also just said no to things. I'm not buying new clothing very often. I have, I actually just created a list that I want to do a blog about. I think it'd be really funny of things that I refuse to spend money on. One of it is parking. I absolutely hate buying parking. And of course I have to sometimes, but it's on my list of things that I secretly die inside when I have to pay for it. Parsley as a garnish, I refuse to buy another silly, silly thing. But anyway, very off topic. I think when we can feel a little stingy with their money, it means that we see the bigger goal. It means that we see the bigger picture. And I think it's okay to spend in some areas that improve ourselves and our lives. So we just have to make sure those are documented so that when an opportunity does come up to spend money, we can say, is this directly affecting one of these things? If the answer is yes, girl, go spend that money and don't even think about it anymore. Because I know you and I have both said like, but should we, even though it aligns to that goal, like go spend it and invest in yourself and love the thing, right? Or if it doesn't in, fall into one of these goals or these priorities, why are you spending this money? And then just ask yourself a series of questions because sometimes we have this feeling of, oh, should I be spending this money for valid reasons because you shouldn't be spending that money? You feel guilty. But sometimes it's because we're just nervous. We have this scarcity mentality and we're afraid of spending all the money in case we don't get more. And unfortunately for that, when we have that mentality, we actually aren't generating more wealth. We're not creating this influx in our life. And so you can explain this piece way better than I can. But when we live in that scarcity mentality, we're actually not doing ourselves any favors. And so trying to spend the money and we deserve it because it's going to bring us this much bigger and better thing in the future. I I totally agree. It's like sometimes you have to spend to gain and to grow and growth will always be rewarded for some for some funny reason growth is always rewarded I agree with you it's it's a really fun topic and it's something that I um, don't know enough about but the things that I do listen to and read about you're right you're spot on growth is never a bad thing and you're always rewarded for investing in yourself um, in your life thank you so much for this wonderful conversation to wrap up I have two more questions for you Let's hear it. Do you have a female role model? 
Well, no one knows her, but my mother is definitely, I would say, one of my role models. She is also a serial entrepreneur that I think I got some of my ambition and my goal-driven kind of ways of life from her. And I think she... I think she's done amazing things and I wouldn't be where I am without her. I wouldn't be in debt without her either, which is what brings us here today. But my mom, and I also just love Kamala Harris, AOC in New York, like these strong women that have no, they they don't apologize for their actions. They don't apologize for what they say because a man wouldn't apologize for saying the same thing. And so any woman that is non-apologetic, that is driven and motivated by a real cause, I'm always behind. Wonderful. And if you could leave a message to all the women in the world, what would it be? I would say, hey girl, I see you and I know it is not easy. You are juggling a million things, but guess what? You're killing it. And so find the passions that you love in life and chase after them. Don't give time or energy to things that don't matter. Don't give financial resources to things that don't align with your values and truly go after what makes you happy because at the end of the day, you're stuck with you and you want to make sure that you're comfortable with the person that you are. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Pimp yourself out. Where can everybody find you if they want to work with you and in general, everything, all your handles? Yes. So I am at Money Gal Coaching on all the things. So Instagram, Facebook, I think I have a couple TikTok videos, which are probably really embarrassing. Um, MoneyGalCoaching.com. And if you go there, free resources. Um, there's coaching, both one-on-one -on -one coaching, as well as I offer group coaching and single sessions. You can buy you can buy a budgeting spreadsheet. All of these items and resources and services are just to get my ladies on a budget, not to be on a budget, but to just live their best lives. We're creating a roadmap to our best lives. And so follow me, tag me, find me. Let's work together and let's talk about money and not make it awkward anymore, right? <laughs> right. Awesome. Thank you so much for making the time and having this chat with me. It was truly valuable. And I think all of our listeners really love this conversation as much as I did. So thank you very much. Thank you. You guys have a wonderful day. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.